Sri Lanka ve pratham varata SLT 4G within then PO TV narambanna itiriyata magena yana SLT 4G Lenga tikuma wedi kara ganna lawaju rupayal 50 adu kala mame enna api te ekak bom Tonight, watch out. Cyber security expert warns of threats associated with moving polls to a digital platform. Once you know a person's preferences, biases, fears, you can be taken on a certain way when it comes to shaping your view on information. More advanced than Europe. Researchers discover earliest bow and arrow use in Sri Lanka. More lapses. Terror ringleader Zaran Hashim's brother not sent for a JMO when he was admitted to hospital with explosion injuries. Getting better. Sri Lanka sees its highest COVID-19 recovery rate to date. All that and much more coming up on First at Nine this Saturday, the 13th of June, 2020. Nava Sunlight Sakura. Then, Dikukal Pavatina Sakura Mal Suandin. From Ada Verana. This is Other There Enough First at Nine, live from Studio 24 in Colombo. Good evening and welcome to First at Nine. I'm Dhamdike Kanayaka. Let's start with your local stories. Now, Sri Lanka is set to go for polls to elect the next parliament on the 5th of August. With the threat of COVID-19 still somewhat lingering, there will be increased online election-related activity in the lead-up to the polls. But there are some concerns. Moving certain aspects of an election to a digital platform comes with added risks. Cybersecurity professional Asela Vaidyalankara believes that people might be at risk of their decision-making process being manipulated by, by or on certain social media platforms when it comes to voting. He aired his concerns during a discussion with Indi Viryamuath on our current affairs program at Hyde Park today. Elections around the corner, we are talking about campaigning online, but also there were revelations how Facebook, our user trends, were incorporated into manipulating people into voting. How do we users, social media users, pay attention to this? This is something that has been cropping up time and time again, especially the main culprit has been Facebook, where there's so many instances of fake news, inaccurate information, and information that is not fact-checked making rounds in social media and because of that causing chaos and harm. This is specifically important in a election setting simply because if you are basically putting out a certain viewpoint and that is factually inaccurate or fake and there is no way to, uh, for a third party to moderate that and mark that as inaccurate, there will be a set of people who will believe that uh -huh. and share that widely because that's how Facebook works. Facebook essentially builds its model on gathering the biases and uh, preferences of people. They say that Facebook currently has about 6,500 data points on you. What I mean by data point is age, sex, meal preference, so on and so forth. But then they have a personalized level. Now, for example, are you a dog person or a cat person? On its own, very innocent. You might ask Asela what you mean me liking dogs and elections, mm. what, what does it have in common? But interestingly, they've developed algorithms, especially Facebook has developed algorithms where it clusters you together based on your preferences, based on your personality on certain types. And very quickly, people found out, this was first evident in uh, President Obama's campaign in 2008, where social media was used heavily, and it reached its zenith in 2016. They realized that once you know a person's preferences, biases, fears, and every other thing that can affect your decision making, you can be taken on a certain way when it comes to shaping your view on information. Mm -hmm. This is what uh, ex exactly happened in 2016. Uh, there was a recent study that uh, they found that people who like Harry Potter mm -hmm. are, supposed are more likely to vote Democrat than Republican. So suddenly you have a situation where you have an uh, innocuous piece of data where they tie that into a political line or a political campaign where you can actually target an ad mm -hmm. to a person who has a preference to that 
and most likely you will vote a certain way. And that is what has been manipulated and weaponized when it comes to Facebook. And Facebook, I mean, there are so many studies, so many governments that have found it in fault. Uh, UN has done a study in 2018 in Myanmar that had found Facebook is responsible for fake information and spreading fake news and hate and so on and so forth. So many Singapore, UK, EU, the US Congress pulled up Facebook and questioned them on their practices. Mm -hmm. And it was found wanting because of the very hands-off approach on the truth. And this is why it's very important for elections. Mm -hmm. Because you might actually come out with uh, a scenario that is completely devoid of the truth, but it might gain traction. Let me give you a very good example. In last year's elections, mm -hmm. uh, Sri Lankan elections, there was a video that was circulating purportedly to be the State Department, where it said the uh, current president was still a citizen of the United States. That was a fake video, what we call a deep fake, yeah. where it was manipulated in such a way. Now, Facebook at no point made no effort to take this video down. Mm -hmm. This video had a lot of traction until it was disproved by mainstream media that this was indeed fake video. And that is the kind of danger you have, specifically if you're moving your elections to a digital setting. Mm -hmm that this type of fake news, manipulation, weaponizing of information, taking information and presenting it a different way could be really harmful in terms of the voter. And also, Facebook is very good at creating something called thought bubbles. Basically, if you have a certain degree of likes and dislikes, you're clumped together and most likely your feed will always show you things that reinforce that view. Psychologists have found when you are shown something that you agree with constantly over and over again, you tend to be extreme in your views. And this is why we are going to have all this friction online where there's so much of friction between people who have two different points of view. A new study has revealed that early humans living in Sri Lanka some 48,000 years ago had crafted tools from animal bones and used them to hunt fast moving animals. What's more, the findings mean that this is the earliest evidence of bow and arrow technology outside of Africa to date. Last year, researchers released a study analysing monkey and squirrel bones found in the Fahian Lena cave in Sri Lanka and it revealed that early humans hunted these animals. The Fahian Len cave has added significance since it is also the site of the earliest fossil appearance of Homo sapiens in South Asia. Scientists say that humans occupied the area during four different time periods between 4,000 and 48,000 years ago. Some of the bones discovered from the cave had been fashioned into tools. When the bones were put under the microscope to ascertain how early humans managed to hunt such animals with the capability to move so quickly, they had seen fractures indicating damage through high-powered impact usually seen in the use of bow and arrow hunting of animals. What it means is that early humans living on the island 48,000 years ago had crafted tools from animal bones and used them to hunt animals. The study also says that the latest evidence is earlier than similar findings in Southeast Asia 32,000 years ago. What's more, the discovery from Sri Lanka predates evidence of bow and arrow technology found in Europe around 20,000 years ago. According to researchers, the earliest clear evidence anywhere in the world of bow and arrow technology is currently 64,000 years ago in South Africa. In addition to the stone tools, the researchers also uncovered beads made from shell, shark teeth and the oldest known beads made entirely from ochre. They estimate the beads to be around 45,000 years old. The researchers believe that these early humans were trading goods with other populations living along Sri Lanka's coast, meaning that they had developed social networks in the tropics of South Asia. Now, shifting the focus to the coronavirus situation, Sri Lanka recorded its highest COVID-19 recovery rate today at a commendable 66.4%, with the overall number of recoveries coming in at 1,252. In the meantime, Chief Epidemiologist of the Epidemiology Unit, Dr. Sudat Samarvir, says that, long, uh, bef that before long, the entire naval base in Valisara will be free of the coronavirus. A total of three new COVID-19 infections were confirmed yesterday. Among them are two naval personnel who were undergoing quarantine at the Vidatapale and Mulithu facilities. 
The remaining person is a returnee from Kuwait who was undergoing quarantine at the Ampara facility. Therefore, to date, a total of 885 naval personnel have been diagnosed with COVID-19 since the first Navy sailor tested positive for the virus on the 22nd of April. With 22 naval personnel recovering from the coronavirus within the last 24 hours, the number of recoveries within the Navy cluster has risen to 679. <laughs> In the meantime, the country's total number of recoveries also shot up after 56 persons were given the all clear to go home. After that, the number of COVID 19 cases in Sri Lanka came down to 621. In other developments, 291 Sri Lankans were repatriated from the Maldives this afternoon. Biological samples of the returnees were also obtained at the Bandarnak International Airport. Meanwhile, 45 Indian Navy sailors arrived in the country from Bangalore today and were also subjected to PCR tests at the Bandarnak International Airport. In the meantime, Minister of Tourism and Aviation Prasanna Ranatunga says that they expect to open the BIA for tourists on or before the 1st of August. Api Agostu Palavindata, Api Balapurutuino, Yojana Kalatino, Guanto to Polivutakaran, Sancharakinta, Etakota, Sancharakinta, Lankavata, Enak, Kriadame, Matamai, Pitrata in Sri Lanka, in Sri Lanki Kenta to Pyogi Karagani, by Agostu Palavindata Pira, Pitrata in Naiva, Niroda and Kromavedia, Tekalanka again, Api Balapurutuino, again, Eka Avsankara in Pasitamai, Api Sancharakinta, Patarineka Samarita, Agostu Palinda. In another development, the government today further to relax the curfew timings. Releasing a statement, the President's media division said that the curfew will come into effect at 12 midnight and be lifted at 4 a.m. on a daily basis from tomorrow onwards. It means that today will be the last day where the curfew will be enforced from 11 p.m. to 4 a.m. The new timings will be effective until further notice. The government urged members of the public to continue their strict adherence to health guidelines that have been issued by the Ministry of Health at all times. The University Grants Commission today announced the dates for the final examinations of all universities in the country. What's more, both state and private universities have been given the nod to restart activities in line with the interim guidelines issued on controlling the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic. In terms of hostel accommodation at universities, the capacity will be limited to one student per room. Samahara Pera denia visvid dialai gatot, krusi vidya pite, visi atavini da aram bueni. Jawa dana pura visvid dialai, agustu maase tamai, hatraveni al wasare daruan ta aram bakaran ni, namut own siluma vibhaga awasana karanwa, agustu maase paloswana da wana vite. Mehidi tina visesh ma deh tamai, neva sikaga reka, eka kama reka, eka daru ek bagging, siti na kare ta tamai. May Katurenia Rude, Vibhaga Pawatwagana, Yana Balapur Tweni. Never the Danum denuturu, Vishavidia la Tula, Ho Pitata, Cover Ho Akare, Ekraswim, Siduan, Beher. Never the Danum denuturu, 
කිසිදු ආකාරයේ විනෝදාත්මක හෝ ක්‍රීඩා කටයුතු සඳහා අවසර දෙනු නොලැබේ තරුණ තරුණියන් සඳහා වන සියලුම පුහුණු ආයතන කාර්මික විද්‍යාල විශ්වවිද්‍යාල පරිශ්‍ර තුල කොවිඩ් දහනමය වසංගත රෝග ව්‍යාප්තිය වැලැක්වීම පිළිබඳ සූදානම සඳහා වූ අතුරු මාර්ගෝපදේශය රජයේ විශ්වවිද්‍යාල වගේම රජයේ නොවන විශ්වවිද්‍යාල වලටත් මේ අනුව කටයුතු කරලා ආරම්භ කරන්න පුළුවන් දුර බැහැර දරුවන්ට අනිවාර්යයෙන්ම නේවාසිකාගාර පහසුකම් තියෙනවා We will see you once more on the other side of this break. Stay tuned. Welcome back. This is First at Night. Now, more events indicating lapses in judgment and negligence were revealed before the Presidential Commission of Inquiry probing the Sunday terror attacks of 2019. It heard that brother of terror ringleader Zaran Hashim, Rilwan, was not sent to a judicial medical officer when he was admitted to the Colombo National Hospital with injuries sustained in an explosion back in 2018. It also heard that had Rilwan been investigated over the explosion injuries, a comprehensive investigation could have been conducted uncovering more information the presidential commission of inquiry probing the easter sunday attacks heard evidence from the colombo judicial medical officer ajit tennakorn yesterday he told the commission that it was revealed by bedside hospital records that zaran hashim's brother rilwan hashim had been admitted to hospital on the 27th of august in 2018 with injuries sustained during an explosion Rilwan had been admitted to the Colombo National Hospital under the fake name of M.I. Shahid by a person named M.I. Sadiq, a resident of the Delgahagore area in Hingula. The commission asked the Colombo Judicial Medical Officer as to what injuries were observed on Rilwan when he was admitted to hospital. The JMO said that hospital records indicate Rilwan had sustained injuries to his hands with several fingers detached, along with injuries to his left eye and the left part of his forehead. Upon admission to hospital, explosion of a gas cylinder had been cited as the cause of the injuries. The Colombo JMO said he noticed that all the medical records had a question mark pertaining to the incident as he checked the bedside patient records. The commission then asked him whether those injuries could be caused by a gas cylinder explosion. The Colombo JMO responded saying that since the bottom part of Rilwan's body had not sustained injuries it was observed that the explosion must have happened when his face and hands were close to something he added that those injuries could not be caused by a gas cylinder explosion since such an incident would cause more severe injuries he went on to say that when perusing Rilwan's medical records it is his conclusion that Rilwan had worked closely with explosives or chemical The commission then focused on a video recorded by Rilwan and released on social media prior to his suicide at a house in the area of Saindamardu. They scrutinized the injuries to Rilwan's fingers and an eye. The commission asked the Colombo JMO whether Rilwan had been sent to a judicial medical officer at any time. The JMO responded saying no and said that on the day Rilwan was hospitalized, he included a note in Rilwan's bedside medical records saying inform police. When the commission inquired as to why Rilwan was not sent to a judicial medical officer, Colombo JMO Ajit Tennakorn said that someone had made a note in Tamil and had signed below it. He added that the meaning of the note made in Tamil is that a police investigation is unnecessary and that Sadik, who admitted Rilwan to hospital, had left the signature. The Colombo JMO told the commission that had Rilwan been sent to a judicial medical officer, a comprehensive investigation could have been conducted uncovering more information. Afterwards the officer in charge of the Colombo National Hospital's police security unit back in 2018 then sub inspector Bandulanana Kara gave evidence before the commission the commission asked him as to what duty was done by the hospital's police on MI Shahid Nana Kara said that no duty was done pertaining to MI Shahid the commission then asked the witness whether he understands that the hospital's police unit had acted irresponsibly at the time the witness then replied with a yes A search operation conducted by the intelligence unit at the Nigambo prison had uncovered the luxurious lifestyles of two inmates. A comfortable bed, a fan, and a refrigerator were some of the things that were found by the officers from one of the cells occupied by an inmate sentenced for organized crime. Within the fridge were items such as cheese, chocolate, some fruits, and some drinks. 
The officers also found a microwave oven in a cell of a prisoner who had been put on death row for drug trafficking. An investigation team of the Criminal Investigation Department arrived at the Nigambo prison yesterday. During the probe, a prison official said that the refrigerator found during the search operation had been donated to the prison by a businessman for a public purpose. However, the CID said that the prison officials had lied about the refrigerator that was found during the search operation and that they will release the report on the investigation in the coming week. Now, President Gotabe Ranjbaksha has stated that the unlawful practice used by leasing companies to seize vehicles cannot be tolerated and such actions during this concessionary period granted for leasing installments is a breaching of law. President Gotabe Rajbaksha has ordered the police that no room should be left to continue the unlawful practice used by leasing companies to seize vehicles of those who had failed to pay their installments. He says that leasing companies do not inform the police prior to such seizing and they lodge complaints only after taking over the vehicle, adding that this kind of forceful action sometimes leads to grave violence. As such, the President instructed the acting IGP C.D. Vikramaratna not to entertain complaints received from leasing companies after seizing. Under the package of concessions offered to the public affected with the spread of COVID-19, recovery of leasing installments from three-wheeler owners was suspended for six months. It was clearly stated in the Section 2 of the Circular 16-2020 issued on the 23rd of March under the signature of the Secretary to the President. In this context, seizing of vehicles for not paying the installment is a breach of the government order. In the meantime, many public representatives arrived at the residence of the Chairman of the Self-Employed Professionals Three-Wheeler Association, late Sunil Jayavardhana, who was assaulted to death by employees of an unregistered leasing company to pay their final respects. The final rites will be performed tomorrow at the public cemetery in Kasbava. Now the water supply in several areas in Colombo will be suspended for 15 hours tomorrow. The National Water Supply and Drainage Board said that areas in Colombo 2, 3, 7, 8 and 10 will be affected by the water cut, which will come into effect at 9 a.m. until midnight tomorrow. In the meantime, water supply for Colombo 1 will be under low pressure during this time period. The National Water Supply and Drainage Board said that the water cut is being imposed due to a pipeline upgrade under the Metro Colombo Urban Development Project. Now, U.S. stocks ended higher yesterday as bargain hunters stepped back into the market following sharp losses a day earlier. But all three major indices suffered their biggest weekly percentage decline since the week ended on the 20th of March. Yesterday's trading was marked by wild swings. The Federal Reserve's indication earlier this week of a long road to recovery and rising COVID-19 cases in the United States had cast a pall over investor optimism about a swift economic rebound. The S&P 500 ended down about 6% on Thursday. Earlier this week, the tech-heavy Nasdaq confirmed that it had been in a bull market since the 23rd of March and the S&P 500 briefly tuned positive on the year. Yesterday, the S&P 500 closed above its 200-day moving average, a closely watched technical level that was last at about 3,013 after moving above and below the level. The Dow Jones Industrial Average rose 477.37 points to 25,605.54 and the Nasdaq Composite added 96.08 points to 9,588.81. Now, oil was a little changed yesterday and locked a first weekly decline since April as New Year's coronavirus cases spiked, stoking fears of a second wave of the virus hitting fuel demand. Brent settled at $38.73 a barrel, up 18 cents, while West Texas Intermediate settled 8 cents down at $36.26 a barrel. Both benchmarks logged weekly declines of about 8%, which is their first after six weeks of gains that have lifted prices off April lows. At the same time, U.S. crude oil inventories have risen to a record 538.1 million barrels as cheap imports from Saudi Arabia flowed into the country. The build happened despite producers from the United States and the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries and its allies cutting supply. 
OPEC Plus slashed supplies by 9.7 million barrels per day, which is about 10 percent of pre-pandemic demand, and agreed last week to extend the reduction. We will see you shortly. Bear with us. Welcome back. This is First at Nine. Now, with the majority of the world's COVID-19 infections being recorded from the United States and Brazil, Brazil overtook the death toll of Britain by currently, uh, uh, and currently records the highest number of fatalities in the world. The country now accounts for over 41,900 fatalities. Now, in the meantime, Director General of the World Health Organization, Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus, says that vaccines for the new coronavirus should be made available as a global public good to ensure that everyone have a, uh, have a fair access to any life-saving products that are developed. Brazil's COVID-19 death toll overtook Britain today to become the second highest in the world after the United States. The total fatalities in Brazil is now just shy of 42,000. Brazil's health ministry has reported more than 1,200 deaths a day since last Tuesday, a mounting toll as the country moves to ease quarantine restrictions and reopen businesses. In the meantime, Peru, which also shares a border with highly affected Brazil, also recorded a massive spike in infections as the total infections there now stands at 220,749. Furthermore, the country confirmed 199 deaths during the last cycle, bringing up the death toll to 6,308. Despite the rising numbers, Peruvians were still out on the streets and in the markets. In another development, former Pakistan cricket captain Shahid Afridi said he has tested positive for the novel coronavirus today. Taking to Twitter, he said that he had been feeling unwell since Thursday and that his body had been aching badly and that he had tested COVID-19 positive. China, in the meantime, confirmed 11 infections of COVID-19 and six of them were locally transmitted, sparking fears of a second wave. Its National Health Commission said that the cases were confirmed in Beijing. Meanwhile, the World Health Organization said that the vaccines for the new coronavirus should be made available as a global public good to ensure everyone had fair access to any life-saving products that are developed. Executive Director of the WHO's Health Emergencies Program, Dr. Mike Ryan, stated that most of the world is still in the first wave of the pandemic. Of course, we have already discussed in that platform of the meeting of the relevant stakeholders a draft allocation framework but that draft or the allocation criteria cannot be implemented unless there is a global consensus on making any vaccine that will be found or discovered as a global public good and for that to happen we need political commitment so a global consensus that's based on political commitment of our leaders will be very important now, Lebanese protesters set fire to roadways and clashed with security forces in a second night of unrest yesterday. Protests erupted last Thursday in several Lebanese cities after a crash in the pound currency, which has lost about 70 percent of its value since October, when Lebanon was plunged into a financial crisis that has brought mounting hardship. The pound appeared to halt its slide yesterday after a government announcement that the central bank would inject dollars into the market on Monday. Protesters, however, returned later yesterday for a second night, throwing fireworks and stones at security forces in central Beirut and the northern city of Tripoli, prompting them to spray tear gas and rubber bullets to push them back. The unrest comes as Beirut holds talks with the International Monetary Fund for a reform program it hopes will secure billions of dollars in financing and puts its economy back on track. And that's it from all of us here at First at Nine. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.